All right, gang. It's 10 after. I should be broadcasting on the YouTube. Hey, hey. So let's get started. I'm an associate member of T3 Trading Group, which is an SEC registered broker, dealer, and member of FinRecipic. All trades placed by me are placed through T3 Trading Group. You should carefully consider whether trading is suitable for you in light of your own financial condition. Here is my position disclosure today. I got stopped out of a little bit of stuff. Um, downsized some areas maybe. Uh, got got out of uh, DKNG entirely. I tried that trade in LTHM today, which uh, gave a nice initial move, but then the broader market weakness stopped me out of it. Um, so there you go, position disclosure. And let's jump into the meat of our meeting here because I think that there is uh, some stuff to talk about. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That seems to be the consensus. Um, okay, so you look at the spies. It doesn't really look like too much happened. We certainly didn't get further bull flag continuation, but we certainly didn't break down. Uh, spies here are down 0.07%, so, so pretty much a flat day for the spies. Uh, down small day for the the Russell here. Um, you know, we, we were looking at this 226 major resistance level for the Russell. Uh, I mentioned in the morning meeting, though, that maybe it's still just a little bit too extended, even though I really like this consolidation. I like this consolidation that we have in front of 26. I love a bullish consolidation in front of a resistance level. It's a great setup for a breakout, but with our breakout level of 226 and the ADMA on the daily chart still at like 223 and change, uh, we mentioned that it might be just a little bit too early still. It's actually a 222.96. Uh, might be still just a little bit too early. So, so that did prove to be accurate. It wasn't quite ready yet. And um, the interesting one was the bloodbath in the NASDAQ. The bloodbath in the NASDAQ. What? Am I, did I say the right words? Did I get that right? Did I, did I mean to say the bloodbath in the IWM? No, bloodbath in the NASDAQ. Q's down 1.4% today. Um, I almost can't even remember the last time that we saw the NASDAQ be independently relatively weak like this. Uh, not a great day for the Q's, especially given that we had that uh, nice close above $400 yesterday. It's not necessarily broken. It's not necessarily the end of the world either. You know, we pulled back and closed near the 21 EMA. So it's still kind of technically intact. But if you were looking for continuation off of a broader bullish daily pattern with that close above $400 today, you did not get it. Uh, TLT, which is the just more immediate proxy that I like to look at for interest rates, is down about a quarter of a percent today. Um, did manage to close a bit off of its lows. Looks like it's slightly higher here after hours as well. Uh, but that TLT being down means that interest rates are up. TLT was down big yesterday. So so this kind of all begs the question, and we had a lot of chatter here in the VTF, so it's, it's probably worth uh, talking about, uh, this this idea of, of the great rotation that Stefan was you know talking about a lot and um, brought up probably a pretty good conversation in the virtual trading floor today. So, you know, what does it mean? You know, broadly, we're talking about rotation from, from growth into value. Uh, Stefan posted this interesting article in here uh, about the great rotation, which uh, I, ha I had a read through on it. Would encourage everyone else to have a read through on it as well. Um, he posted that earlier today. Uh, so let's kind of chat about it a little bit. Let's uh, give some thoughts, give some opinions. So um, to be fair, the value guys I know have been, have been looking for this rotation for years and it hasn't really happened at all until maybe somewhat recently. We, we've seen some fits and starts of um, that rotation. So again, taking a half step back, what does it mean and, and what would be the cause of it? So, so, and I know we've spoken about this a lot in the past, but it, it, it's, it's worth a refresher here. This all comes down to interest rates. And right now, interest rates, 
come down to inflation numbers. But the market has the market the last 10 years has been in a place that I don't think it's ever been in history where we've had interest rates at zero, right? Yeah, Cuppy. I don't know who Cuppy is. <laughs> um, but I do know it's your view. Uh, so, so, so interest rates have, you know, basically been at zero forever. Uh, not forever, for the last like 10 years. And it's a very unique phenomenon that we've never really seen in, in kind of the history of our capital markets. And what it has led to is the ability of some of these companies to exist. And, and in some cases, there's there's been some serious success stories, right? So, so you kind of have the... I almost hate using this term, but this is the term that all the growth companies like to use is like the Amazon business model, right? Where we can choose to just be a company that loses money, loses money, loses money, we'll keep raising more money, and we'll lose all this money to try to get our company to a scale where then once we've scaled the business big enough, then we can kind of flip the switch and, and become profitable. And that has enabled companies, honestly, like, like Tesla, Tesla probably being the most primo example here, to exist, and I like to look at like an Uber as well. Um, but but these types of companies that have just been money losing companies for year after year after year, uh, like a company like Uber, just would not exist if we were not if they were not kind of formed in an environment where money was free. Um, it's been so easy because interest rates have been near zero for these companies to raise capital. And the high interest rates have, have also enabled really high PE multiples from a fundamental perspective for a lot of companies that are out there. Because um, what you gotta remember is that so, so there's a finite ca amount of capital that's out there. Obviously the amount of capital and, and the amount of money that's out there has increased um, just because of Fed stimulus. Uh, but there's a finite money amount of money that's out there, and when it comes to investable money into marketplaces, uh, all asset classes really compete with one another, right? So, um, there's if, if you've got a hundred dollars and you're trying to decide, do I go into bonds with that hundred dollars? Do I go into equities with that hundred dollars? Or or what percentage of my hundred dollars goes into equities versus what percentage of it goes into interest rates? Uh, sorry, goes into into bonds. Um, those are competing assets, and the answer to where you're going to put your money depends on the expected return of that money. Well, the the, the generally expected return of a bond is, is, especially if you talk about like a treasury bond that's supposed to be risk free, is pretty straightforward, right? It, it's the interest rate. So the lower the interest rate is, the less likely you are to put more of your hundred dollars into bonds as opposed to um, you know putting it into stocks and, and I'm keeping this uh, example very simplistic obviously there's other competing asset classes out there as well that are competing for your money like uh, commodities gold cryptocurrencies now kind of all that stuff and again interest rates being basically zero for the last you know 10 plus years has made it so a lot of these companies could exist that wouldn't exist otherwise, has made it so that companies can be uh, companies that lose money for year after year after year after year on just kind of a hope and a promise that eventually they're going to be real companies, and has also enabled, uh, you know, historically high multiples to, to kind of take place. And now the idea here is, as interest rates increase, that that will um, deflate those multiples a little bit. And it will potentially make it so that you know the next Uber that wants to come online may never even be able to get started just because they won't actually be able to you know raise money for year after year after year while losing billions and billions of dollars to actually eventually hopefully someday become a a, a profitable company. So this has already been having an effect on the market for quite some time. Um, you know, I've been saying this for a while. The, the spec stock bubble ended in February 2021. You know, we've got that list of spec stocks that are already down anywhere between 50 to 85 percent, depending upon which which one that you're looking at. But the interesting thing is that we hadn't really seen 
Uh, so first of all, we hadn't really seen a huge move in the TLT to the, to the downside, which would in indicate that interest rates are actually moving higher. And there's been a, a number of reasons for that. And we also haven't really seen too much, I think, rotation yet into these value type stocks like energy stocks and, and financials. We, we have seen a bit of it. Um, I remember uh, back here in, in, in November, November 2020, Stefan on the team here called out the move in the energy stock so perfectly. And, and we broke the kind of descending channel here that the XLE was in. And then the XLE was just this run here, this first run was incredible. Bull flag continuation, bull flag continuation, technical price correction continuation, technical price correction continuation, technical price correction continuation, bullish consolidation, breakaway gap, uh, another bull flag with the gap as the as the flagpole continuation, technical price correction, hammer continuation, and then after a, a beautiful run here from November um, all in, into March, that was really in a lot of ways overshadowed. But the fact that at the same time you had the spec names just super running and going like 400% of the time, then the XLE started to go sideways, has spent most of the rest of the year digesting that big up move until now recently. And um, at the same time, the spec stocks just have gotten destroyed. So even from like a, a relative performance perspective, energy versus spec stocks uh, for 2021 uh, you, you can't even make the comparison. You know, energy value names have, have already uh, been been so much better. Um, the the question really is, though, is is this just the tip of the iceberg? Um, are, is there a potential that we see significantly more downside and multiple contraction in those spec stocks? And and you know, it, it is always good. What was I looking at? I think I was looking at Square at one point today because I was like, oh, man, the Square just broke down on this bear flag again. Like, oh, my God, 300 bucks, 255 at this point. It's a real company. But we still want to have some perspective, right? It, it, it's very easy to just look at a chart like this. You know, I'm just looking at it from a, a one-year perspective or it's easy to look at a chart with just a 90-day perspective and look at this 90-day on Square and be like, oh, my God, the stock is so destroyed. It's such a – it's a value to be able to buy it here, right? It's a great dip-buying opportunity. But if you have some perspective, look at where this thing was at the coronavirus low. Square was a $32 stock. So you're still looking at this thing at 156, and, and I'm sure that the company, I don't follow Square too closely. This just happened to be one stock I was looking at technically earlier today. I don't follow like the fundamentals of the company too closely. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure that Square has done some great things over the course of the last year and a half that, you know, there's been growth internally in the company or whatever it is. But still, if you just kind of kind of close your eyes and don't look at the pullback on the chart and think about a move in this thing from March 2020 to, you know, January 2022 and that the stock went from $32 to $155, that's still incredible. So from from where do we go from here? <clears throat> well, if we continue to see that multiple compression and we continue to see the interest rates increase and everything else, well, you know, maybe this stock belonged at $80. And it's still an incredible move from 32 to 80 bucks, you know? Or if you want to even instead of using like the coronavirus low as your reference point because we know things got a little hectic there, maybe you just want to use a reference point from, you know, 2019. Though the real fundamental guys and I'm and I'm sure that Stefan is in this case. I already seen the out of the corner of my eye. He's telling me that I got to look back 5 to 10 years. Um the, the real fundamental guys were saying even at these prices in 2019 that these things were overblown at $64, $65. And then it was the coronavirus stimulus that then just, you know, was a needle in the butt and just even, you know, more steroids to the market that kind of created this thing. Because maybe if you want to have that more even further view back and you go back a handful of years 2015 keep in mind this is still when interest rates were zero now you're looking at a 11 dollars stock here for square again i'm sure the company itself has done a lot of great things since 2016 when it was an 11 uh you know over the course of the last six seven years but 
do the great things that the company has done in those years justify a price increase from $10 to $155? And, and, and my direct answer is I don't know. Um, you know, most people are either in, are, are, are really big on either one camp or the other. And, um, you know, we, we, we know which camp uh, Stefan has been in. And, and to give him some well-deserved credit, he has provided some excellent ideas here uh, to the team and has had really good conviction even in pullbacks, you know, calling out the energy names in, in November of last year, uh, November of 2020, 2020 for us, right as that rotation first was coming in to begin with. Um, you had me in that fly position, I remember. Because uh, you kept saying, I think this company is going to get bought out. I think this company is going to get bought out. I had a big position in it. Then it got bought out, and you made me a lot of money. So, so uh, a, 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 a lot of props uh, where, where props are, are, are pretty much well deserved. Um, most people seem to be in, in kind of heavily in one camp or the other. Right, you you got your your fundamental people here, and again, that whole fundamental thesis does rely on the root of it, and that's why it's worth it to read this article that he was that he posted earlier. Um, it it relies upon the fact that so so to take an even half half step back further, what I was gonna say is you've got two camps, like almost like you got the Kathy Wood camp and like the Warren Buffett camp, right? You got the growth camp and you got the value camp, but if you the deeper root of that is the inflation viewpoints. You still have people who think that, and I know we're not using the word transitory anymore, but you, you still have people who think that inflation is going gonna, is gonna to come back down. And um, to be fair to those people who think that, that these levels of inflation are not here to stay, uh, you know, coming out of the financial crisis, when the Fed put a ton of money into the market, which I know is now only a percentage compared to what we put into the coronavirus um, uh, crisis, uh, a lot of people said that that was going to lead to massive inflation, and it didn't. Um, now here for the first time, we actually are seeing the highest levels of inflation that we've seen in 40 years or, 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 or whatever it is. And there's been massive amounts of, of money that's kind of pumped into it. So you got these two camps on inflation. And it's almost like where you are in your thought process and in inflation, because that's going to determine where interest rates are, then therefore also determines what your thought process is on this growth versus value battle that we're kind of talking about right now, right? Um, so, so you got some people who who say, and, and I'll be honest, I'm a little bit more in the camp of I, I don't I, I don't think that we're gonna see. I don't think that we're gonna see like 13% inflation start start coming in. I'm personally kind of more in that camp. I think that some of these factors, not all, but I think that some of the factors that have led to higher inflation will subside over time. Um, I think that the the supply chain economics, which has been a, a, a big factor of inflation, that we are going to get through that. Um, at the same time, though, it, it seems probable to me that energy prices and energy inflation it, is going to actually continue. And then the anti-inflation stance, though, which also would put you in the growth thought process stance, is um, is innovation itself. Right, like, like the, there's a real argument to be made that you know the the costs of goods and everything else. One of the reasons why inflation has been low is because a company like Amazon has been able to exist, and you can argue for sure that the, the negative aspects of Amazon, you know, putting your mom and pop business out of business, um, but also the positive aspects of it is I'm able to get stuff for a lot cheaper, and that brings you know my costs down. Then finally, you know, it's it's not it's not it's not a, a simple topic, right? Because then there's also globalization, um, and again, I, I know globalization is a political topic. I don't want to get into politics. I just want to focus on how it affects markets and and kind of trends here. So you know, globalization, you know, an understanding of international economics basically tells you that in a perfect world. You would have every country or every state or every people 
kind of doing what they're best at and what they're able to do at the lowest cost. So it makes sense for, you know, maybe Vietnam to be doing a lot of manufacturing. And then the United States, we have a competitive advantage in, in education, right? So we export our education, just using this one basic example, we export our education to foreign students. Many, many students from India, China, Vietnam, from all around the world, they come to the United States and pay money to the United States and bring money into the United States for um, education to come to our, our top universities. And we spend our money and we give it to you know Vietnam and China and India to produce our goods because they have a, good, a, a major competitive advantage when it, when it comes to labor. So doing things that way and having that aspect of globalization, that also keeps costs broadly lower and helps to kind of damper uh, inflation. But what we've seen now, and, and in some ways, again, not to get political, but in, in some ways this seems to be one of the very few almost bipartisan things right now, which is just to like, and I guess COVID affected this as well, but it's just to like be more anti-China or whatever and, um, you know, wanting to make more of our goods in the United States and, you know, buy America is kind of becoming a thing again. And and that's sure and great if you have the means to be able to do it. But just just keep in mind, you know, your whatever an iPhone costs now, a thousand bucks or whatever, if iPhones were 100 percent made in the United States, this thing would be like seven thousand dollars. Right. So that it. So so getting rid of globalization, which has become um, almost like a political trend and COVID has has helped that because COVID has exposed some of the problems of globalization that actually also increases inflation, which is why I said, um, you know, a few weeks ago that if if we're worried about inflation, sure, there's things that the Fed can do to damper it, like raising interest rates. Uh, but there's also things that the the, the U.S. government could do, such as getting rid of all of the tariffs that uh, Trump put on in his administration and that the Biden administration has just broadly continued with, um, and increasing globalization again because that'll, that will be able to uh, be one way to kind of damper inflation. So it, it's, a, it's a very convoluted, complicated topic that has many aspects to it. Um, but if you think that inflation is going to continue, if you think it's here to stay, then that puts you in the case of higher interest rates are coming. If you're in the case of higher interest rates coming, then it kind of puts you into the value side of the argument. It, it puts you on the Warren Buffett side. If you think that you know in, inflation is going to go away real quick, we just got to get through you know the supply chain stuff. If you think that. You know, the, the Fed, which now has a really solid track record of being very slow to raise interest rates, is going to, you know, do their increase in tapering. And then when it comes time to start increasing interest rates, inflation will have tampered down a little bit, but the economy is not going to be doing necessarily as well either. So they're not going to rush to increase those interest rates. That that could potentially put you more into kind of the, the growth category. All this stuff is like that big picture qualitative fundamental stuff that you want to think about but it has a heavy impact on our on our trading um i personally for the time being am actually in kind of both camps at the same time if that's possible so <clears throat> I, I i am a big believer in kind of being long and, and, and the stock charts are confirming it and being long value right now being long energy, look at this move in energy from, from mid-December. Uh, being long financials, you know, you guys have caught Bank of America recently, JP Morgan recently, um, Oxy recently. You know, we had, we had a, a really good call in Chevron. I had a really good call in Chevron, I guess, you know, from the morning meeting today on its, its price target increase. Um, you know, Ford, maybe you can make the argument is, is well, it's definitely more of a value car play than, uh, you know, Tesla, Lucid, or Rivian. And this, this one, some of you guys have just absolutely crushed in the last couple of days as well. Um, so the, the way that I'm kind of able to be in both camps at the same time, if, if that's possible, is, first of all, the, the charts are confirming value, right? 
uh, I, I really do think that energy prices are going to continue, while I also think that the supply chain issues that we've had are going to improve. I don't think, like the article says here, I don't think that inflation is actually going to continue to blow up massively. I think it will in certain areas, and, and, and I think one of those areas is potentially energy. But I, I do also believe in, because I've seen it, the effect of... Um, well, basically the you know the effect of of globalization, which I, as much as we pull back from that, I, I don't think that that's gonna gonna disappear entirely, and also the effect of innovation, um, you know what companies like Amazon have been able to do, and you know for all the arguments that you could make against a company like Tesla, the fact that they've been able to you know kind of come online, and um, you know a lot of these companies have, have just enabled people to just have lower costs with, with what they're doing. I do think interest rates are going to go up, but I don't think interest rates are going up to 4%, and I don't think that they're going to have to. And I also wonder what's priced in. So yeah, you know, you can, you can look at a company like Square, which is working its way to being down 50%, and you could say, all right, it's down 50%, and you know... Sure, the multiple should compress because interest rates are going to increase. But th think about how easy, historically, let's say that, that we have our, you know, three interest rate increases, maybe even four over the course of, and keep in mind the timeline, right? How long, it, if, if it goes perfect based on what the Fed is talking about, how long is it going to take before we're at 1%? Is that going to be mid-2023? And that's 1%. 1% historically, that is super, super accommodative. 1% isn't free money anymore, but it still is super cheap money. I, I don't think that we're seeing interest rates going online to 5% or 4% anytime soon. And I think it's at 4 or 5% that that is where 100%, you get, you get interest rates at, at, at that area first of all we're probably in a massive economic recession as a country uh inflation would have to be through the roof for that to happen it, it would create also all types of problems just with the federal deficit and, and debt that we currently have um so i i, I that's how i'm kind of I, I hope i'm getting this point across properly this is how i'm kind of able to be in both camps at the same time personally if that makes sense um, big believer in these value companies right now. Uh, the technicals are totally confirming them, but I, I still do also look at you know some of these companies that I've been stalking here a little bit, which are which are growth companies. Uh, that DKNG, which I got out of today, or you know ones that I think are really interesting, like a, like a SoFi. You know, SoFi definitely losing money, but they're you know, trying to be innovative and they're trying to do things that, you know, other traditional banks have, have not been able to do. So some of these specific companies I do have an interest in, and I think that they're good enough that, yeah, sure, um, interest rates going to, let's say, 1% will have a negative impact on the company. They won't be able to borrow money for free. Uh, the multiple will have compression. But when I look at some of the companies or, or even a DKNG, DKNG is super interesting to me. You know, Americans love their vices, right? People like to gamble. I don't gamble at all personally, um, but uh, I, I know so many degenerate sport gamblers, it's insane, and it's never been easier for them to, to do it. So, you know, when I look at the prospect of something like a DKNG in the long run, even though I know it's priced really high, if interest rates are going to be moving higher, um, that's obviously bad for this company, but it's not like they're not going to be able to raise money still at 1%. Some of these companies are definitely going to go bankrupt. You know, some of the real BS kind of ones that are, like, like I still don't understand, like, the skills for the life of me. Um, I've looked at the company. I even tried, you know, I've downloaded a couple of the apps that they have, like, created where you, like, kind of these play these stupid games online and you can kind of, like, make money from it. I, I don't understand how... Like this is a company that is really going to be like worth anything, but some of the other ones interest me. You know, DKNG or even a company like Path. I don't have a position in this Path, but I'm always kind of looking at it because it's robotics. And you know, 
these companies right now who are dealing with a pullback in globalization uh, but can't hire anybody, they're gonna, they're gonna start employing robots, right? And a company like Path Ten, you know, has the potential to be able to grow into. That's the whole point of a high PE valuation. The thought process is that the company can grow into its valuation over time. This thing is down also 50 plus percent from its highs. I think that there is, you know, potential viability in the company. And then I look at just the broad bullishness still of the spies, the Qs, and and and, and the IWM. And I'm like, well, listen. Sure, you know the the Fed is not pumping as much money. They're not buying as as, as many bonds as they were on a month to month basis as they were. The taper has absolutely started, but guess what? They still are. They still are, and okay, fine. Even you know a year and a half from now, interest rates begin to increase. Are they going to increase so poorly that we, we you know that these companies that I think are decent companies that are already down. I mean, what percentage is DKNG down from its highs? First of all, I was the first person to say here back in February and March that these companies were bubbles. I didn't believe in them at these prices. But still, when you're talking about a stock going from $75 to $25 and is down like you know 70% or whatever it is, it's not like interest rates are going to 5% tomorrow. It's not like that stimulus is still coming in. And look at the rate of descent of these stocks. So I'm like actually super bullish. Maybe in some ways I'm like the most bullish out of anybody in any of the camps because I think that there's room, at least for the time being, for all of these companies to potentially move higher. Uh, I'm not talking about DKNG and I never have been talking about DKNG going back to $75. And I'm still always talking about managing your risk. I got stopped out of my DKNG position today. I've tried it a couple of times. I've liked the idea. I tried it uh, back here on this day, back on December 17th. Caught this great two-day move, nice bounce, created another lower high, and then failed. Um, I bought it again on Thursday of last week, looking for that January effect to potentially come into play. The January effect really got derailed today by uh, interest rates increasing yesterday and today, and 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 that's fine, right? You know, by having good execution, each time there was enough of a move here where I'm able to cover my risk and then get stopped out and move on, and that's totally fine. And I'm going to continue to look for those setups, though. Because I think it's realistic when this stock goes from $64 in September to $25 in December, that fast of a down move, when the market's a forward-looking mechanism, that pendulum sometimes swings too far too fast. And I, and I kind of think that that's what I'm looking at here with some of these stocks, not all of them. Again, I still don't want anything to do with like a company like Skills. Will I take a momentum trade in Palantir? Will I take a, a momentum trade in Skills if the technical setup is there? Sure. Am I ever going to be able to believe in that company as a real company? No, I'm not. But some of the other ones I do kind of think have the potential to really build into viable companies. And I do still think that we are far enough away from those big interest rate hikes um, to enable that to actually happen. So but the, the bottom line, though, on all of this, this is all what I call the camp of qualitative fundamentals. And I do think it's really important to have a background in this because having that you know, background thought process can able, enable you to have a thesis. When the technicals correspond to your thesis, that's when you make a lot of money. So if you had a thesis of value and banks and you took the BAC trade at $46 that we talked about yesterday, congratulations, you're getting paid. Or the JP Morgan trade at $160 from yesterday that Pat was all over, congratulations, you're getting paid. Or the Ford trade at $21 from yesterday, congratulations, you're getting paid. Or if you're involved in this oxy with Stefan, congratulations, you're getting paid. The technicals will always give the, the, the bottom line confirmation. And it just is what it is at that point. So I think we can, I personally think that we can be looking for setups on both sides. We can look for these setups when we see that momentum come in into like a DKNG like we saw last Thursday. And then guess what? You manage your risk. I have no problem with the fact that I got stopped at a DKNG today. Because my risk reward, I think, was phenomenal. I executed that trade super well. I'm buying this stock on Thursday, December 30th here. Um, the low is 2460. I think my price was like 20. Uh, sorry, sorry, the low is 2640. I think my price was like you know 2680, something like that. Um, you know, really good price. I'm you know two dollars in the money on this thing. But the reward potential here is I have a potential double bottom if this thing 
was able to hold today, these two kind of equal lows, this is the midpoint of the W pattern. If this breaks to the upside, I'm looking at a move to, you know, $34 to $38. That's going to be a phenomenal risk reward for me if I'm coming in with, you know, 30 cents risk or whatever I had risk wise on this trade, 40 cents risk, something like that. And I'm able to capture a move off this double bottom daily chart here to, you know, 36 to $38, even if it's just a, a kind of short term bounce after the degree of the, the sell off in this, you risk 30 cents and be able to capture a move that that's, you know, 10 bucks in your favor. I'm going to take that all day. So I think I can be looking for these setups. And I think I can be looking for these energy setups and these bank setups. And I think it can be doing it at the same time. And the market itself, the technicals of the market itself are still confirming that we want to be really looking at longs right now, even if today was a little bit of a weaker day. Now, the interesting thing now to, to fast forward all of this into kind of our last couple of days of trading, the interesting thing was yesterday into today. Yesterday was a full on risk on day. Interest rates went up, the TLT sold off. So yeah, interest rates went up, and we understand because we just discussed it, what the implications are of higher interest rates. But also keep in mind that the TLT is a defensive trade. So it's a fear trade, right? So when they're selling TLT, that also is potential of risk on. And we just saw risk on everywhere yesterday. They sold off the TLT. They didn't care that interest rates were higher. Everything went up. Financials had a huge day yesterday. Energy had a huge day yesterday. But guess what? Tesla had a huge day yesterday. Apple had a huge day yesterday. Uh, some of, not all, of the spec stocks had decent days yesterday. Um, it was just a very broad-based buying. I was actually looking for continuation on that today. We did not get it. We definitely did not get it. Today, all of a sudden, so yesterday was just risk on across the board. Today, all of a sudden, the market was like, you know what? Today, we're going to decide interest rates matter. Yesterday, we're like, we don't care that interest rates are going up. Everything's a buy. Today, today the market was like, oh, you know what? We decided interest rates matter, even though they didn't matter yesterday. And we're going to show extreme amounts of relative strength in certain areas and extreme amounts of relative weakness in other areas. Today was definitely a victory for the people who are in the camp of the great rotation from growth into value, where we saw these cues get smoked. You know, Qs are down 1.4%. Some of them held up okay. I think that the Apple daily chart is okay. I think that the Tesla daily chart is okay. But other of, the, other of them got rocked. And the speculative names, once again, they really felt, because this is where you're going to see it the most, they really felt the weight of that increase in interest rates. And that DKNG trade that I put on on Thursday where I got my risk covered because risk management is always the most important thing in the entire business got my risk covered got my stop loss in place I, I i get stopped out of the trade and it just is what it is and if you're in you know a bank of america or jp morgan or an oxy at the same time then you know that that's exactly how you want to be probably positioned in this environment you want to be taking all of those technical setups that are in line with you know kind of what your thesis is and 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 just because these are the ones that are working right now you still have to keep in mind that there is no such thing as 100 percent probability of success so there is still a real world where something happens right now and next thing you know the opposite happens and we have a big switch again though without a doubt i think probability is for continuation in value names. I, I don't think that they're done. I also don't think that we can chase. I, 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 and, and I always think that way about chasing price. I don't care what, I, I, if we're talking about growth names, value names, I, this, is, this is technicals now. And when you're talking about setting yourself up for technical risk reward, um, there's been plenty of opportunities to get involved in these names, and, and in some cases there still are. You know, Chevron gave, I think, a great setup today. I know Stefan doesn't like this one as much as, uh, as some of the other ones. Um, uh, but there, there were still, you know, good technical setups to be had to kind of come into it. So, so that's my personal thought process on it. Who's going to be right? Who's going to be right? Is it, is it going to be the growth camp? Is it going to be the value camp? Or is it going to be some sort of in-between scenario, which is kind of where I am, where maybe it's like kind of both a little bit at the same time? Who's going to be right? I have no idea. I have no idea uh, because I don't have a crystal ball and I can't see the future. I can kind of only give my logical thought process on it. But honestly, 
if you stick with your technicals, if you stick with your risk management, if you stick with your trade setups, and you recognize that a chart is a chart, and you're not biased against being long a Bank of America because you want to be long a Palantir, or the opposite, then you're putting yourself in the position for success and you're putting yourself in the position to make money. Um, so that is uh, uh, pretty much what I wanted to talk about. I had one other thing I wanted to talk about, but it's, it's gonna kind of limit my ability to take questions because we're already starting to go long here. I, I had one other thing, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it really briefly and then maybe I can expand upon it in, um, in another afternoon meeting in the future. I, I was thinking about Jerry's question from the afternoon meeting yesterday. Jerry, are you here? Um, I was thinking about it further uh, earlier today. Re Jerry, I think it was you, had a, had a question about, hey, uh, you know, for newer traders, should we really focus on one specific setup first? And I kind of gave my, my thought process about that yesterday. If you, if you missed it, then go watch the afternoon meeting in, uh, in the Derek the Trader YouTube from yesterday. Um, I, I actually expanded on my thought process a little bit further. So I, I, it really got me thinking about it. Like, like the trading business is a difficult business when you are a, a new trader. So, so Jerry's idea, and it's a great idea, is um, you know how do we make it almost more a little bit more simplistic for a newer trader to focus on a couple specific things and try to master those things and create a process around those things, and that then becomes a bridge to success. And honestly, that's how it was for me. When I was a brand new trader, I basically had one specific trade that worked for me, and that was my, maybe two, and that was like my big focus, and I really just focused on that, and I was able to make, you know, decently small amounts of money, but with good consistency in the beginning of my career, and, and focusing on that, but also uh, being a person who was inquisitive, I, I was at the same time also really trying to learn and, and think of other things outside the box to expand upon it, um, really helped me become successful. Uh, because sure, I had these like two specific trades that I was really focused on, but it while I was I was focused on those trades, it enabled me to learn more about technical analysis, about gap analysis, about all the other stuff that we kind of talk about, and that growth over time has kind of led me to to where I am today. So I I think that that new traders should, in addition to what we spoke about yesterday, trying to find a couple specific trades that they can really focus on and really try to master those couple specific trades, for example, the breakout trade. Um, in addition to that, I think that you want to almost try to build a checklist for yourself. And, and I was thinking about it, you know, I, I have my, my probability class, right? And, I, and I've said it before, my, my probability class, I think, is one of my most important, if not the most important uh, class that I have in my training program, where I talk about these layers of probability. But I, 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 I am, am toying in my brain, and maybe I'll try to do this myself for new traders, but for now, if you're a newer trader, you should just try to do it maybe for yourself. So it, it's not just the trade, right? A breakout, isn't, isn't, every breakout is not equal. Just as we know, and Jerry's question was about inside bars, um, every inside five is not equal, right? And, and you even referenced yourself understanding the probability factors around it. So I think that what new traders should do is, is not just learn those two trades, which they should, but then, and this is where trading gets more difficult, is recognizing that not all trade is created equal. You almost should just create a checklist for yourself. And that checklist can be the layers of probability. And then basically what you do is, here's your trade. Your alert goes off. Everyone sees in the morning meeting how I put my alerts in on certain stocks that we talk about in the morning meeting when you guys bring it up. I go, oh, that, that's interesting. I like your idea. And you'll see me put the alert out, you know, 15 to 25 cents usually kind of in front of the level that we discussed in, in, in the morning meeting. So what you guys should do if you're a newer trader, and maybe that's it, you know, you just have your breakouts and you have your alerts out for them, but then also create a checklist for yourself of the layers of probability. And then as, when your alert goes off, the first thing you do is you go, okay, where's my checklist? And then you just, bam, time of day, 
relative strength, no, not there. Uh, trend, okay, what the trend? Okay, daily chart technical pattern, got it. Uh, news, okay, no news. Uh, volume, okay, no volume. And now you've got your, whatever it is, nine points, or I forget, it's, is it nine that I have in there? And now you've got that very specific checklist. And maybe as a new trader, you, you should be starting with something, just trying to keep it as simple as possible. I am a big believer in the acronym when it comes to trading KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Um, you just start with that one specific trade and you do your checklist and if it hits five things on the checklist or whatever it is, then that's a trade that you take and if it has less than it, you don't. And you try to keep it as simple as possible for yourself as you learn okay and then you know in time you build in the breakaway gap trade and you build in you know um your hammer capitulation setup and your double bottom and kind of the other stuff and then and then you you work away into it so anyway it was just something i was thinking about and it was based off of jerry's question from yesterday i just wanted to expand upon it i think i might try to work on that a little bit myself maybe i can even create like a a specific document for a newer trader that they can just kind of go through as they get an alert for any trade that comes off and and then you know work on the execution and the execution is a big big aspect of it as well that's why it's good for you guys to have little groups of people that you can work with because you need to have someone also to hold you accountable um, accountability is a big thing you know it, it's one thing for me to sit here and, and, and look guys I'm honest right I, I, I don't have I don't have the capability to be the person who is being specifically accountable for all 150 of you on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I can't look at every trade that every single person on the team is looking at every single day. I, 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 just, I just can't do it. But you guys can have a peer or something like that you know, share your email addresses, give yourself a, a peer who could be your accountability partner. We all have the ability to put, you know, execution dots into into charts, right? So you got your execution dots, um, you know, in your, in your chart and you have your accountability partner. And then at the end of each day, you, you know, send like a journal to your accountability partner and that journal should have a screenshot of the chart with the executions. And then if your partner and you are only supposed to be um, focused on breakouts, you got to make sure then that the execution is good, right? If the breakout level is $50, did your partner buy $50? If the ignition bar low on the five minute chart that he's using as a stop loss is, um, you know, $49.80, did the guy get out at $49.80 when the trade failed? Or did the guy get out at $49.45 when the trade failed, which is no good? So you create a list for yourself and then you work with your partner and your partner holds you accountable to then make sure that you're following through with your strategy, with the layers of probability, and that the execution is sound. So maybe that's something that you newer guys can, you know, work on and reach out to each other and, and, and try to, um, you know, put that together. Because, you know, I, I try to do my part as much as I can on a big picture, right? I, I can't sit down and go over every trader's trades on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's like physically impossible. I'm already working 12 hours a day or, or more sometimes. Um, but this is the forum that we use as a group, right? The afternoon meeting... Our Q and A is here in the afternoon meeting where you guys can ask questions and we can review everything. And, and that's why I'm always trying to emphasize. I emphasized it yesterday in the afternoon meeting. New traders, experienced traders, I don't care who you are, ask questions. I don't care if it's a beginner question. I don't care if it's an advanced question. This is how we are all going to advance as a team. With that said, try to keep the questions at a minimum today because it's already five o'clock and I got a bunch of stuff I still got to do. Uh, but I'm going to scroll up in the VTF here and um, try to answer any questions that were, were posted in here. All right. Uh, so scrolling up here. Cool. So we got Cubby. We got Stefan. Harrius Kupperman, my neighbor. He's a great drinking buddy. All right. I got to come down and uh, join that, that drinking club. Um, from Christian, if we keep some lots from a day trade overnight... Can we add back on the second day some lots we sold the day before as long as we don't compromise our one-to-one -one kick or do we treat the swing trades as a whole new trade? I do that, Christian. 
that is what I do 100%. Um, you know, I like to cash flow, you know, cash flow day trade around my swing trading positions, and that's what I'm doing. Um, it does make the game planning complicated. So make sure that you're experienced enough and that you're able to handle the game plan, that you're not messing up your trades or ruining good trades by adding back or anything like that. Um, but that's definitely what I do. Moving on here to Robert. What to do if I prepare my whole game plan for long, uh, name like HPQ, I missed. I did not want to chase it and all the other names from my game plan are not trading into the long side. Would you rather flip your long game plan names and look for some intraday shorts together uh, with the Qs or start looking at relative strength names? Uh, but then I feel like I am preparing a game plan on the fly and it's more gambling for me than trading. Yeah, so, so um, I think that you should take a step back. I don't think you should force it. That would be the first thing that I would say. I know personally for myself, and I think that most of you guys are the same way, my best trades are trades that have been properly game planned before the market opened. It doesn't mean I never take a trade on the fly. It doesn't mean I don't make adjustments as the day goes on. But I am also hesitant to make big changes in my thought process on the fly when the market is open and my P&L is moving because I know my thought process is not going to be as objective. So I think that the answer is... Yes, you know, you can try to make adjustments. You can look for other trades, but I think you need to do it cautiously. And I think it is just fine if your trades don't trigger to not trade. Or if you missed a trade to not trade, right? You know, if you had seven names on your watch list, one of them triggers and you miss it, and the other six never trigger, and you don't place a trade that day, I think that's just fine. Um, I think that's just fine. Now it can't be every day, right? You can't you can't never trade because then you're not going to make any money. You got to press the buttons. You're going to make money, but don't force it. You know you can make those adjustments during the day. You can try to trade some new stuff, but you got to be a little bit cautious on it because I I, I broadly agree with you. Um, Yeah, Gabriel, Fubo is one of the ones that are on my list also of those um, growth names I think could actually grow into their value and grow into something as opposed to like a skills, just using that as an example, which I, which I don't think can be. Uh, from Oriel here, I know this is quirky, but do you think the Super Bowl at SoFi Stadium will bring exposure, increased prices? Um, I mean, that's what advertising exists for. So I, I don't know when the Super Bowl is. I don't know who's playing it. I don't know where the SoFi Stadium is. Are the, are the Giants in, in the Super Bowl? Probably not, right? Um, I, I can't name three football players. So this is actually all news to me. Uh, but, but maybe, you know, I mean, that is literally what the purpose of advertising actually is. Uh, next here from Greg. How do we replicate the screen that Derek is looking at? Um, I got six screens here, but I think you mean the one that I'm sharing. Uh, all it is is, is volume daily candlesticks and 8 and 21 EMA and a 200 SMA. So it's it's probably pretty easy to rebuild for yourself. Um, from Gateway Ironworks, asking about NEO. I, I, I still like the company a lot. Um, this, like a lot of the other uh, growth type stocks, just got slammed today with the increase in interest rates. So we didn't get any follow through for it. I, I didn't really like it as a trade today really either, to be honest, I know someone brought it up in the morning meeting. Uh, but I do still love this candle from Thursday. This candle from Thursday is still very much intact. But today's candle is not good. I like the company. I think it just needs a little bit more time. I'm, I'm, I'm bullish biased on it. Um, from Sebastian, can you recommend some people you trust in economics? I listen to podcasts from them. I don't trust any economists. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I studied economics in college. Uh, economists are like analysts, only possibly even worse. <laughs> right? It's just all all theory, and they're never accountable for anything. Um, with that said, I, I know that a lot of what I'm talking about on a day-to-day -day basis, even what I was just talking about in today's meeting, is an economics focus. I, I don't have a good answer for you, Sebastian. I, I apologize. I, I don't really... I don't have any economists that I follow. Um, maybe I'm lucky enough because my educational background is in economics 
that I, I kind of naturally in my brain apply an economic thought process onto the market data and environment as I see it and as I learn it. Um, so, I, But I apologize. I, I don't really have anything for you there. I don't really follow any economists specifically. Um, yeah, uh, gas at the pump I noticed was still pretty expensive on my drive back from, from Vermont. I was surprised because I thought that oil had come down. I guess it bounced back already since December. I don't think that the price of the pump ever changed from this brief downtick, though. <laughs> it, it was at its higher prices from October, November, and now it just stayed at those higher prices. Um, so, yeah. Next from Mike. Uh, no question for me today, but just wanted to say I saw your YouTube short from yesterday, and I'm with you. Awesome, Mike. Awesome. Let's go. Let's take it to the next level. Uh, Jerry here. Yep. So now we're this is back when we we're talking about um, our setups. Yeah. So so go back and you know review the the probability class. I think that the one I don't talk about in the class itself, which I really view now, is option flow. Um, so it makes it like eight or so, I guess, factors. Could potentially affect anything and then and then there's a lot of other one-offs you know the ones I talk about in that class are a little bit more ubiquitous so they're kind of almost always present or not present and you can look for them but then there's also one-offs that you can kind of learn that will affect it over time like, like it's gapping or whatever um, Yeah, Greg, you can also circle back with Pat on your on your computer layout, your trading layout. Uh, Steve, that 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 um, classroom whatever is uh, for people studying for the exams. You don't got to worry about that. Mike's looking for a partner to review trades with. That's right. Last year, I literally only watched the uh, halftime show, I think. Honestly, Super Bowl Sunday is one of my favorite days to ski. Um, it's one of my favorite days to ski because the mountains are relatively empty. And, and it, it's, a, it's great being on the roads when the Super Bowl starts. There's no traffic. You're probably not even getting a ticket. Cops aren't, aren't trying to be out giving you speeding tickets. They're trying to watch football. Um... <clears throat> Linkov here sharing a spreadsheet for people, so that that's that's pretty cool. I like that. Uh, I don't know, Greg. You could try YouTubing it. I think it's I think it's kind of straightforward at a certain point, though. I mean, I would just start with like the, the the layout that Pat gives, and then if you have any specific customization that you're looking for, you could just ask him about it to, to add it on. I mean, <clears throat> if anything, my layout's gotten more simplistic over time. Um, yeah, I got a bunch of screens here, but I just got a couple market makers. Uh, I have a chart of the spies and the queues that's usually set for a five minute for two days. And then my focus stock, I've got a, a, a daily chart, a 15 minute chart, and a five minute chart. And then I've got my uh, like pending order and executed orders window, and I've got my open positions window. And I've got like a short request box in case I need to see what the shorts look like. And I've got my um, messages box in case I need to see why I can't execute a trade or whatever. Another massive crude draw, 6.4 million barrels. Okay. All right, gang. Um, I think that's going to be it for today. I think this was a good meeting today. You know, we really covered some important stuff. I'm, I'm also bullish on oil with you. Uh, so I will see everybody tomorrow. Have a great night.